Welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's Not So Giant Women, the podcast. Ivy and Daria are here and ready to watch so many birthdays. So <laughs> we got birthdays and gems. <laughs> what do we think of that? <laughs> uh, my first thought, just to peel back the curtain a bit here, we're recording right next to Christmas and the title reminded me of a Christmas film where someone time loops to make Christmas happen over and over and over again. Oh. It made me wonder if someone was making their birthdays happen over and over and over again. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Ooh, one never knows, but we're about to find out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and here we go. All right. Are the crystal gems? We'll Love always this theme song. save the day. And if you think we can, we'll <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> okay, that was, that was a strange one. Mostly, mostly character comedy, despite the fact one of them was on the verge of death. Some pretty creepy stuff in this cartoon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay, I'll see if I can recap it. <sighs> Upon searching through Amethyst's quarters... <laughs> which seems like a danger in itself. Uh-huh. Stephen finds a picture of the gang in old timey clothes, or the gang and a shark who is difficult to get to pose. And they explain to him that, yes, it's the reason they're in old timey clothes is because it was old times and they are hundreds of years old. That Stephen is aghast that this means they have missed out on so many birthdays mm-hmm. and decides to make up for it. They try to explain that gems don't really do birthdays, but Stephen is in full Stephen mode. <laughs> Amethyst, meanwhile, has found a five-year-old fish burrito, <laughs> which she eats. <laughs> At this point, Pearl is also explaining that while gems don't age, they can still get hurt and die, but not from food poisoning, though Amethyst is certainly putting in the hard yards for that one. He has a series of birthday parties for each gem in complete not reading the room fashion. He gets close with an appropriate one for Amethyst. She just doesn't know her own strength (laughs) for hitting piñatas and is appalled that in fact she has to hit through a piñata to get the candy rather than simply be able to have the sweets right away. Pearl is a complete misread as he decides (laughs) a clown act would be perfect for her birthday party and It's about as successful as you'd expect. Garnet, they try to have kazoo races, which are like these little dodgem things. And Pearl and Garnet are expressing that maybe they're just too mature for this. Amethyst, meanwhile, squeezes herself into one of the kazoo races. So not everyone is too mature for this. (laughs) No. (laughs) They express, though, that birthday parties are just a thing for human children. And after the lack of success, this makes Stephen sad. Despondent, he stomps into town for a bit of a sulk, but as he's walking along, his gem flares up and starts to age him, and he starts taking on the appearance of, well, first a pubescent teenager, in which his feeling old reminds him he can't play Wackerman Jr. at the arcade. He has to play regular Wackerman. <laughs> he goes on and ages again to a full-grown square-jawed adult in which he gets himself a t-shirt that designates his job as beach hunk. So Stephen <laughs> still hasn't quite worked out how jobs work, thinking you just buy t-shirts. So he hasn't matured that much. <laughs> By the time he gets to the donut shop, he's into mid-middle age, looking a bit like Danny DeVito. And the, the donut clerks don't recognize him. Sadie and Lars don't recognize him. When he sees his reflection, he figures he must have started getting older, which of course he has, and thinks a reverse birthday must be in order. What he needs is the robe and crown he's been dressing the gems in for their birthdays. He refers to this as his birthday suit. (laughs) This middle-aged man asks Lars and Sadie to help him into his birthday suit and they chase him from the store. (laughs) His sad little self Transitioning through a stage in which he bears a passing resemblance to his dad, I might add, starts to return home but gets very old and collapses and Lion, Lion's back, takes him back to the beach where the gems are still cleaning up from parties. Notably, it's at this point that Pearl notes that this is kind of fun when she's doing cleaning up. The gems are alarmed. They realise 
the Stephen Gem. This is a thing that so many things is called Gem, but the Gem people realise the Gem crystal on Stephen <laughs> has aged his body, and they're not sure how to reverse it. They think more birthdays might be in order. They try to reenact the highlights of the birthday parties, but it doesn't work and just kind of makes him older. Garnet briefly thinks violence might work and starts shaking old man Stephen. <laughs> While they're getting quite distraught, Pearl is crying. So there's the which gem do you think will cry first <laughs> answered for us. Pearl starts crying. They all start getting very emotional and bickering with each other. And when the on the verge of death or age coma or something, Stephen sees this, he gets exasperated at their bickering, their childishness, and tells them off and as does so reverts to his initial adult form. They realise that the crystal on Stephen, he is reacting to his state of mind and they encourage him to feel pure and childish and innocent and only occasionally obnoxious <laughs> until he reverts to his natural form, which he does and they all hug him, Got it. noting they can work on the rest later because he still has the adult Stephen legs even though he has the child body and to credits. Oh my goodness. I think listening to your recap is just about as good as watching the show. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it all plays in my head while you talk. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, we've probably heard I was getting a lot of laughs out of this one. Yeah. It was very much a character-based episode. Even Stephen's tragedy was hitting a lot of comedy beats. Oh my goodness. I found it very disturbing, honestly, but uh, I don't know. It's like... I mean, it's cartoony, but at the same time, it's just like, it's my body horror thing that I, I just never liked anything where somebody's body is changing uncontrollably. And like, there's a lot of cartoons and stuff that are about something is happening. They're turning, even in this cartoon, we've actually had that same plot where, you know, he's turning into a monster. He's turning into a cat monster and trying to find a way to stop whatever's going on. But, you know, I just, ugh, that whole thing just really creeps me out. Well, yeah, especially if this one's advancing him, presumably closer and closer to aging to death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is more fundamentally disturbing, I guess, because, you know, we're we're all aging much, much slower, but it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, he pulls off like a hundred years in an afternoon. Yeah, yeah. I think when this uh, episode aired, that blog that's sort of canon, the Keep Beach City Weird blog, Ronaldo claimed to have noticed the world's oldest man running through town. <laughs> <laughs> but they still hit each stage with some age jokes, like the mm -hmm. the younger adult Stephen figures, he has to be responsible and get a job. The yes. pubescent one is doing some amazing voice-breaking business. Mm -hmm. Like you said, I like the Whacker Man joke. <laughs> a boy on the cusp of manhood can't spend the whole day whackering. <laughs> How are you getting this past the radar? It has been censored in some countries, <laughs> but not ours. <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, I like what you pointed out in the uh, recap that he thinks getting a shirt about his job is basically all you have to do. <laughs> it's like it's like a child's understanding of what an adult is. <laughs> yeah, and he thinks that Love Doctor and Beach Start are actual occupations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too squeamish, he says. <laughs> The professional beach hunk shirt does exist as, I believe, official merchandise, but I do not have one, sadly. <laughs> I should get one. <laughs> Maybe I should get one of those for next summer. Ah. Yeah, and I, I like his comment about how he thinks he's going to have to eat fiber cereal and all his teeth are going to fall out. I'll have to eat oatmeal and it'll be sugar-free. He's so sad about that. And the birthday suit jokes because... Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I liked seeing the gems try to have birthdays. I, I liked that Amethyst was kind of into it. And the other two were just like, I don't know what's going on. Garnet's like going to humor everyone. Pearl's just disturbed the whole time. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Garnet kind of, it kind of suited her as a crown and the robe. There's a name for that kind of robe and I've forgotten it, but it was a crown and robe. <laughs> I agree. And it made her feel important. <laughs> yeah. And she has a sudden violent streak, which I suppose we've <laughs> seen the cusp of before, but not to the point of shaking around old men on the beach. Yeah, I mean, we've only ever really seen her punch monsters and 
walls and stuff and the ground, but I've never seen her shake an old guy. And I felt, uh, I don't know, such an internal revulsion at Emesis's burrito. Yeah. I, I, uh. Yeah. <laughs> Partly because it's a fish thing and fish seems to go off worse than any other meat or food I can think of. Yeah. Um, truthfully, I was kind of just, I was thinking it would be the worst in like the week or so after it went off. I don't know why it's starting to stink five years into the process. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense. You'd think it would so, have rotted away or something by now. Yeah. Maybe it was in a magical bubble and it just popped. Yeah. Maybe Amethyst was... <laughs> Trying to get ahead of the bubble points and just faked bubbling a burrito instead of an actual gym. She had preserved it so that she could eat it after restaurant closed. <laughs> that would be an Amethyst line of thinking. Oh my goodness. This is my new headcanon now. <laughs> she went and got a bunch of them and uh, left them in her room so she could continue to enjoy Aqua Mexican. Yeah, she, she figured if you get a burrito and then eat it 20 minutes later, it's still fine. So another 20 minutes should be fine. So five years should be fine. Yeah. I mean, you're going to waste that. So <laughs> yeah, it's pretty gross. In fact, this episode also gives us a dual pronged. Stephen says that their bodies are illusions, but at mm-hmm. the same time, Amethyst manages to stick a rotting fish burrito into her illusion and feel awful. So mm-hmm. It yeah. wasn't a standard illusion anyway. Yeah, I mean, I guess she's uh, she's not going to die from it, according to Pearl, but uh, she sure seemed uncomfortable. Yeah. If you bother to have a body at all, why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> I guess it's one of those, uh, they can't die from food poison. We still get very sick. Yeah. She might have wished she could die at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think it could have been too much further in the future that uh, they were having a party for her, though. <laughs> yeah, true. So funny. Oh, nobody got presents. How come nobody got presents? No, good thing. I would have thought Stephen would be all over that. Yeah, yeah, he could like he could give them um, cookie cat wrappers, and <laughs> <laughs> he can't give them cookie cats. He could do more vastly inappropriate character choices. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, what could he give to Pearl? That would be the worst. <laughs> oh, giving her one of those silly string shooters. Yeah. <laughs> too frivolous she and too messy. It. She would hate it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> and Amethyst would grab it in about two seconds because she'd love oh, it. Yeah. yeah, and then Pearl would probably have fun cleaning it up. <laughs> that was really cute when she started to have fun at the party by putting things away. <laughs> It was good. Uh, I had also agreed that Stephen looked like Danny DeVito. <laughs> yeah. He definitely looked like, well, yeah, he really looked like uh, he had even gotten shorter. As happens to some people when they get older. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, and he told us his middle name. Yes, yeah, that fits. It's, <laughs> it's his mom's surname. That happens to a lot of us. Mm-hmm. Yep. Stephen Quartz Universe. So he has a Q. As a middle initial. <laughs> Stephen Q. Universe. There you go. Very official. What a name. <laughs> uh, did you, uh, I imagine you noticed that uh, Onion was stealing tickets. Oh, Sunday. yeah. The second Stephen said how innocent he was, he's, he's yes! thieving away. Yes. And what I really liked about that is how it sort of retroactively explains why he had so many tickets in the arcade episode when he was giving Mr. Smiley all those tickets and he got that moped. <laughs> And it's like, where did you get all those tits, dude? Well, well, now we know. He just takes them out of the machine. <laughs> You're an enigma, Onion. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. I would have liked to see Amethyst and Steven playing with the kazoo racers. <laughs> yeah, it was a shame he got disillusioned so quickly because I'm sure she was up for that. Yeah. Which way to the baby war? <laughs> <laughs> so cute. <laughs> like this ugly little baby. <laughs> In Amethyst's mind, that's what babies look like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, why not? She's purple. Yeah. She can be a little purple baby. And again, despite Pearl's lip service, Amethyst's the only one shape-shifting. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. She even shape-shifted into a pinata at the end. <laughs> <laughs> she would have let Stephen beat up on her <laughs> if it would have helped. His mature voices were interesting. 
Yeah, I was wondering about those, yeah, Mm -hmm. as you went through voice breakage to adult voice to, well, right through to incredibly old man voice. Yeah. Yeah, I think at the time that he was recording this, he was somewhere in his, uh, you know, late teens. So that was kind of closer to how he usually sounds when he talks. So I think that's pretty cool that they were able to use that in an episode. (laughs) Yeah, I'd wondered if it was him all through because I think the regular adult voice would be hardest to do. Yeah. Because obviously obviously he can do the kid voice and a bit of voice breaky stuff for a good actor to go there, but to do a sort of straight adult voice without sounding too comical, that must have taken some skill. Yeah, it sounded like he was trying to make it a little deeper, but it still sounded natural enough. Yeah. I thought, I mean, he's a good actor. Like most of the time he just has to sort of yell and scream and be an annoying kid. But like, it's, it's really obvious in episodes like this that he's very talented. Because when he got super old, he sounded kind of more like Stephen having an old man voice. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. No, oh, I guess it's good that you can still hear his, uh, is the timber of his voice like throughout. So I was really sad that he walked in there looking and talking like an old guy and Sadie and Lars don't recognize him. They're like, Stephen who? <laughs> I'm so sad. Well, it showed us fears of aging at the same time as you don't need to get too old too fast. Right. Yeah. It's funny the the things he was saying to Lars in particular, like are the kind of things, just like with the t-shirts, it's kind of what he thinks a grown up would say. Like, yeah, I used to make jokes. <laughs> you got to smarten up, act like an adult. Because one day everybody's going to grow up without you. <laughs> now I want that donut. Yeah, I want that donut right there. <laughs> He's funny. <laughs> and then he's asking for his birthday suit. <laughs> I like the flash cut then too. As soon as he does that, we just cut the outside and you better run. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, did you notice that Garnet cried a little bit too? <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed they were all, they were all very emo- emotional, like mm-hmm. deeply emotional, not just flying off the handle at each other as they sometimes do emotional. Yeah, like, I uh, that was actually, I mean, you could tell they were seriously worried and scared as to what was happening to Stephen. Yeah, I really appreciate that because it helps to enhance, like, how you're supposed to feel about it. I mean, that's certainly part of the reason why I was as disturbed as I was, is that they were all freaking out. I mean, even Garnet is freaking out. You're like, oh my gosh, something is going on. She doesn't know what to do. So <laughs> it's like, all right, this is a very serious problem, but it's a human problem. That's enhanced by gem magic. So they have no idea what's going on. This has never happened to them. Yeah, um, and from what Pearl says, offhandedly, they might not have known if Stephen was going to age humanly once he got to adulthood. Yeah, seems like there's a lot of unknowns with him. Maybe uh, it's one of the reasons he lived with them and not his dad, apart from the van thing. That if there's mm-hmm. any weird half gem side effects there, they're better suited to deal with it whereas the whole world is suited to deal with effects of being human. Right. They just don't know how to feed him. (laughs) Pearl was saying that she would be delighted to eat this pie or whatever. I do like pie. And then it turned out to be a joke. But uh, so far, nobody's eaten anything except for Amethyst and Stephen, of course. And I think we can take as read Amethyst is as much a sensory experience for eating. Yeah. Yep. Even if it's something that's going to give her a belly ache. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and make her throw up. It's probably as much. I've never tried a vintage burrito before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh. probably lucky for her. It is hard for a gem to die because she probably would have snuffed it several times over, left to her own devices if she wasn't well, not immortal but quite robust. Oh my goodness! Yeah, she'd be giving cats a run for their money. <laughs> At least nine lives in her. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So we didn't find out how old they actually are, but That's it's, right. it is obviously a good few centuries, even for, well, for all of them, including Rose. Yes. So yes. That, that at least, and maybe they're old enough they can't immediately put it into human terms offhand. Yeah, it is really interesting that they don't put a number on it and, you know, none of them even try to, and he doesn't ask. 
Well, he does ask. He says, how old are you guys? And she just, Pearl says, just much, much older than any human. And she seems very excited about that in that scene for some reason. I win. I'm oldest. I win. <laughs> much older than any human. So the big takeaway of the episode is that many burritos have died in Amethyst's room. <laughs> no, the big takeaway is that we, we learned this about them and that Stephen, his, his age will fluctuate based on how he feels, at least in this episode. Yeah, this is Jem reacting to his feelings again, even though it wasn't love this time. Yeah, <laughs> it's just feeling old. <laughs> yeah, I liked that painting. It was really cute. Oh, yeah, so... Um, Reminded me a little of the Crossing of the Delaware painting, except that doesn't have a bouncing shark in it. Yeah. It's a more direct reference to a painting called Watson and the Shark. Oh, okay. I don't know that one. It's a very old painting from uh, the 1770s. That was the kind of era their outfits looked like, yeah. Yeah. Which is also kind of when from the Delaware paintings looked like, so mm-hmm. maybe that's what triggered me in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny to look at the... The outfits where they, they seem to be wearing uh, like colonial kind of stuff. And I don't know who the other people are in that picture. <laughs> uh, so let me see if I can think of something related to ask you. That's a deep question. <laughs> something about aging. How about uh, since, okay, since they've been here for a really, really long time, but they seem to have no clue about how parties work or how birthdays work or anything like that. Like they don't know what a clown is. Why do you think they've been avoiding learning about that and avoiding humans? Well, it's possible that pre-Stephen, at least, because I'm willing to guess that raising a human child prompted more involvement in at least local human society, almost by default. Mm -hmm. So it could be they saw themselves as above humans or so different to humans that they just didn't get involved, or they saw themselves as only doing their job of popping up to defend from the various monsters and disasters that happen and then they go back and just live in sort of gem isolation yeah Uh. i mean rose must have involved herself in human society at least a little bit in order to meet greg so i was just gonna say at least we know rose must have been curious about some stuff if she goes to hang out with a human guy and have his baby so maybe at first they're sort of these things are just born and then they're gone in only a hundred years or so how can we even get attached Mm. and they they just built houses made of bits of trees like (laughs) creatures in the woods (laughs) so that could be another thing that as humans society got more advanced interesting they found themselves getting curious Mm. it's a good possibility just you know Sometimes when they seem really clueless about something, I'm like, why don't they know this? They're thousands of years old. Even if like, even if you lived in a cave, which they kind of do, like, I don't know, I guess eventually pick some some stuff up, but they just seem so utterly clueless sometimes. (sighs) Or there was some incident, Stephen's age plus a few years ago, in which they had to sort of come out of their shell for whatever they had to do. And it's like, oh, maybe maybe these creatures are worth mingling for a bit, even if, you know, you just take a century-long nap and they're gone. <laughs> because as we've pointed out before, Amethyst has no problem working around in human society with the food and the games and the sleeping. And mm-hmm. I'd say she'd probably got her own Netflix account, but she's probably stolen someone else's password and using that one. <laughs> I would not doubt it. And you can certainly learn a lot about human culture, or at least what we like to pretend human culture is through our media. (laughs) I can imagine Pearl watching television for the first time and just getting more and more freaked out and appalled. Oh my goodness. I bet you Pearl would be more willing to read books. Ah, yeah. I can see her having a taste for the ancient literature that survived. Mm -hmm. Whereas Amethyst is a bit... America's Funniest Time Videos. Look, that guy got whacked in the crotch again. This is awesome. Yeah. Let's watch Jackass. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would be her jam. <laughs> She'd be like, why am I not on here? <laughs> like, I could eat all the dangerous things. I could jump in a shopping cart and roll down a hill <laughs> and not even get hurt. I could be the shopping cart. <laughs> Amethyst, you can't have your own cable access show. <laughs> I wonder what type of media Garnet would like to enjoy. 
after the video game episode, I can see yeah. her having a penchant for something which was not what you'd expect. <laughs> Probably. Uh, uh, well, I These guess monster that... trucks are valiant warriors. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> oh, she would take it very, very seriously, whatever it is. I could see that. <laughs> hmm. Let's see. Okay. What else do we do? Music has no music except for the little birthday songs even sang. Yeah, I noticed the birthday songs, uh, but it was just a quick in and out, that one. Yeah. Might as well be your birthday. (laughs) (laughs) He had one of those little echoey mics. (laughs) That was cute. Mm. A a few food options. Uh Uh-oh. Nothing quite so distinctive, but, well... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Nothing quite so distinctive that you'd eat like a unlike the five year old fish burrito. So about that <laughs> I just set it up for these listeners, really. <laughs> oh my goodness. I did actually try to make the burrito. It's a very weird story. Uh it is definitely um one of the worst things that I've eaten. I obviously did not I don't eat tuna because I don't eat fish, but mm. I attempted to get something that's possibly worse. I went out and got vegan tuna. Uh, Um, I don't know if you've seen this, but it looks and smells like cat food. Oh, right. It is brown. And uh, I I figured that with something like a burrito that is attempting to look like it's five years old, I could probably do all right with vegan tuna. I threw some guacamole on there to make it look real green and fuzzy. Let's see. I believe I had some rice in it. And I think I only had white rice, so I had to put some soy sauce into it or something to make it look brown and old and weird. Can't remember what else I put in that thing, but I may have put one or two other things. I may have put like cheese or something. I I was mostly trying to make ingredients that you could really, you could eat and it would be all right, but they would look disgusting and it really smelled disgusting. However, This is a really sad story, Uh, actually. Mm -hmm. I was eating it, and it was not good. But then I got a phone call, and I found out that my grandfather passed away. Oh, no. That day. And so for the rest of the day, I did not know if I felt gross and terrible because of that news or because of the burrito. Oh, no. (laughs) Isn't that horrible? So that, so, uh, <laughs> that must have truly been one horrid burrito if you I mean, can't immediately <laughs> distinguish it from shock and grief. Yeah, I mean, I had a stomach ache and I'm like, would I just feel like just achy and terrible, you know, like if I hadn't eaten this absolute abomination or <laughs> like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a very strange reaction. But anyway, it was unexpected as well. He was 96, but it was still unexpected. <laughs> So I always think about like, I hope I didn't just accidentally uh, contribute to my grandfather's death by eating something disgusting in another city. (laughs) That would be one terrible burrito. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did not throw up from it though, but I did not eat all of it. I just couldn't. (laughs) You didn't make another one later and say, this one's for you, granddad. No. (laughs) So funny. Uh, much later, I see now usually I try to only do food that gets eaten, but then, you know, I've realized there are quite a few things that I've made that never get eaten, like the together breakfast and, you know, a few other things. But I was very tempted to make like birthday spreads that look like the one that was for Pearl and for Amethyst. Garnet didn't get one. She just got kazoo racers. I guess he figured out that no one was going to eat his food, but I made a cream pie that was like the one that got smashed into faces. And I did make some little cupcakes and I made some, what did I make? I made, oh, a cake. There was a cake with a bunch of candles on it. And I I did that. And it was fun. You know, any excuse to make cake. I love, I love to make cake. (laughs) So, so I made those and they're very good. (laughs) I noticed, you know, of course, because when you try to reproduce something like that, I noticed that it was very like messy. It was like a kid made it. Yeah. So, um. It was like two layers and the bottom one partially was frosted and the top one was a little more frosted, like he had just dumped a bucket of icing on top of it. It was really funny. So I tried to make mine not properly iced as well. (laughs) Fun. (laughs) Yeah, that does sound much nicer than a burrito. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. I don't know. I still have yet to find a good substitute for tuna fish that tastes good. Um, I've tried a couple different tuna substitutes since I became vegetarian more than 20 years ago. And it's like, I just can't find something. I used to like tuna. Yeah, I've had good vegan fish, but I don't know if it was tuna. Yeah, I have too. Yeah, and that also it was done as fillets, not minced up into cat food right. burrito things. Yeah, I was shocked at how just abjectly brown and smelly this was. Like, mm. ugh, and not in like a good way at all. So I don't know. And you look up reviews for it online, and everybody says it's cat food. It's cat food. <laughs> so I'm sure Amethyst wouldn't have minded, but. Well, when you know. people eat those little tins of tuna at work, which are insanely popular, so what I can smell of it reminds me of the smell of, well, cat food. So mm-hmm. it may just be a property of tuna they've decided they need to replicate. I guess so. You know, with some of these vegetarian foods, like the veggie bacon and stuff, they try to duplicate the patterns of how it looks with the strips of white fat in them and stuff. They try to make it look like that. And I'm like, just make something that tastes good. It doesn't have to look like it, but they want it to look like it. So Yeah. Uh, I had uh, vegetarian chicken wings, which, you know, obviously not chicken, at a friend's house a while ago, and they had little wooden bones in them. You're kidding me. No. They have bones? That's, like, That's ridiculous. And it's like one of the advantages of eating a vegan counterpart to meat is that you won't have to worry about bones. Right. It's one of the things I like best about eating vegetarian hot dogs is that there's no, um, I don't know, I've had I've had a few hot dogs that you bite into it and there's gristle and it mm. was like, it grossed me out so bad. Like every time it happened, I didn't want to eat hot dogs for a really long time. And, you know, now I never eat hot dogs, so win-win. But you know, I, I wouldn't want them to duplicate that. <laughs> I want all the good things about eating meat and none of the bad ones, okay? (laughs) There's a local hot dog place that's amazing, vegan chorizos, which I now that I've thought about, I I now have to have one. Ooh, sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. I like hot dogs, but I don't like corn dogs. Is that weird? Uh, I don't know because corn dogs aren't really a thing here. (laughs) No, definitely a thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I've seen them. I'm sure they've been around. I'm sure people have made or sold corn dogs, but they're not as, put it this way, even I know how present they are in America and I don't <laughs> live there. Yeah. Maybe it has something to do with um, how cornbread is a thing in my region of the country that people, the Southern food, it's Southern, Southern food is big on cornbread and it has to be done like your mom did it. And, <laughs> you know. I got a big old education on how these things must be just so from a Southern friend making a script. Oh, wow. <laughs> so she was going all out. Apparently there was some ingredients she had to like really go nuts to source because oh, this wow. was, this was before you could just dial up international food and get it delivered within a couple of days. Oh, wow. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. I've seen some recipes that basically say, if you can't get this specific thing from this area of the world, don't bother making this recipe, (laughs) like with a cheese or a wine or something like that. And she wanted us to have the full experience. She didn't want some close enough with Australian ingredients. She wanted us to feel (laughs) like we were in South Carolina in 1966. Oh, I don't know who would like to go there. Probably a lot of white people. (laughs) I was going to say, outside of the breakfast part, the rest of that would make me pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. (laughs) You know, living uh, in the American South, like one of my best friends is a a black guy who says like, you know, when you talk about time travel, you talk about science fiction, Mm -hmm. you talk about alternate universes that take place in, uh, you know, areas of the country, like the one I live in. And it's like, he says, you know, if you were a person of color and you time traveled back like 30, 40 years even, not to even imagine like hundreds of years in America. Yeah. It's like you would not have a good time. <laughs> I mean, you barely have a good time now, but yeah, it's like it's- only recently that it was even protected, like your life was protected by law. So I don't know. It's, yeah, it's often got glossed some- over in fiction, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, uh, yeah, I don't see I don't see enough acknowledgement of that, and I also don't see enough acknowledgement of uh, you know uh, disease and horse poop in the past. <laughs> yeah, oh, 
I can't remember what it was, but I was reading a, in the past few months a time travel novel in which one of the things that struck the protagonist was the amount of horse poop on the ground because they never put that on Masterpiece Theatre. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess uh, in the old days when our gems were getting that uh, portrait done, they may have had to avoid horse poop. <laughs> Amethyst didn't mind. Yeah, I was going to say, be, Amethyst, just, just don't, it's, it's not like a burrito, just don't. Yeah. She's probably got a sample somewhere in her room. Hey, this is 1700s horse poo. We're like a little museum of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like you could go on an archaeological dig in her room, probably find a few other different kinds of burritos. Well, it might just have been a quirk of the art, but it, I'd say from... This episode, compared to when we last saw her room, it goes much deeper than we initially saw. Mm. Seems to be a bit, pretty big room, too. So we may be seeing different wings of it. <laughs> so does it, like, expand to fit? Like, when she's only been living in it, say, you know, 10 years, is it, like, about the size of a room? But as she gets more stuff, does it sort of ease out for to feel like 100 years or 200 years worth of her accumulated crap? That's what I want to know, because... Uh... Temple obviously has its own uh, laws of physics in there. Uh, considering, you know, uh, in Together Breakfast, Stephen was running upside down <laughs> through the hallways. <sighs> so I would not put it past that space to be able to accommodate seven or eight yard sales worth of stuff. I don't know Amethyst at the average yard sale. <laughs> oh, Amethyst and Stephen at most of the yard sales or garage sales or car boot sales I've seen would be very dangerous. Oh my goodness. The related comic books, as I've uh, mentioned, are kind of canon in some cases, but in general, the ones that are being made now are not. And uh, there's a mini comic in one of them where someone in town is having a yard sale and uh, Amethyst really wants this guitar that has two two necks. <laughs> she just wants of course it. she does. She does. I need this. It has two thingies, she says. So, of course, she wants to put that in there. As I recall, they uh, she didn't have any money. So the person that she's trying to get stuff from, is, she says, uh, you can have something in my room. <laughs> the person's like, why would I want anything in your room? And <laughs> then uh, Pearl is like, I could, I could fix your car. <laughs> and she's like, my car's not broken. And Garnet says, I could break your car. <laughs> It's the best. I love it. <laughs> it's such a good little side comic. The person who wrote it clearly understood the gems very well. <laughs> mm. well it's one of those it's one of those things that shows Garnet kind of 90% gets it. Mm. But just those remainders, she can completely leave the paddock. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's logical. I mean, this is a problem. Oh, your car's not broke. I break it. <laughs> I mean, it probably made sense to her. Yes, well, fixing the car is good. If you can't fix the car because it's not broken, you break the car so you can fix the car, which is good. <laughs> Very funny. Oh, my goodness. Gotta love that. Let's see. I have a little list of things here that are factoids that I have not read to you yet. Oh, oh there's almost nothing in it. <laughs> Besides that, I heard this once that uh, this episode used to be called uh, 10,000 Birthdays. I'm glad they changed it because that doesn't really make sense. Like, nobody really is having 10,000 birthdays in this episode. So. No. And maybe they didn't want to nail down an age yet. Could be. Because even if they don't have an age per se, unless they are very, very cosmic, presumably there was some point at which they did not exist and a later point at which they did. Yeah. I imagine they were born sometime. So this one was... Um, the people who, who drew this one were Raven and Paul again. They're the same people who do the other scary ones. <laughs> so Raven, Mollesey, and Paul Vileko were the artists. So um, weirdly enough, they were not on Cat Fingers, but they were on Frybo. <laughs> uh, so they're back again, horrifying us. That's wonderful. Yeah. It must have been fun to design Stephen at the different ages. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I've seen like planning boards for that. I'll have to look it up. That'd be fun. At first I thought he'd gone back too far, but it was just because he had the enormous shirt. Yeah. Yeah. His ace looked young at the end. 
And then he looked normal. Anyway, I think the only thing that I, I wrote this down because I wanted to tell you what the uh, descriptions are. And I can't believe this one. It's like four lines long. I'm like, why would you tell everybody everything that happens in this episode? We've discussed this. Anyway, but it says Stephen learns that the gems are thousands of years old and decides to make up for all the thousands of birthdays they've missed. When the gems don't take kindly to his childlike birthday party, Stephen sinks into a gradually worsening depression that makes him grow older the more he fears outgrowing things. Oh. I'm like, okay, well, now I don't have to watch it. <laughs> huh. yeah, even the well, even the the local streaming one, I, I think someone because once I knew they were safe, I went when I did some rewatches. I was on the local streaming service, mm-hmm. and depending how you view it, sometimes it just doesn't have the descriptions at all. But if you go through a different menu, it does. Mm-hmm. But for this one, it just has. When Stephen learns the gems are thousands of years old, he decides to make up for the birthdays he's missed. Mm-hmm. But doesn't go on to describe all the rest of the episode. I wonder where that was posted because I did, I did not go look like where that was listed. Yeah, I don't know where they get these from. I don't know if someone at, at Stan watches and does one for themselves or mm-hmm. or what. But yeah, mm-hmm. I, th- I think that one it would, for example, would be enough to whet one's appetite without spoiling the whole thing. I mean, I'm not reading ahead to the others, but the ones I know I've seen, I can see they've, for a lot of them, they've just got a sentence which teases but does not say, and then halfway through the episode, this happens and you totally won't expect the end, which is this or something. Yeah. <laughs> That would be terrible. Uh, I don't have any other factoids to list. I just mostly wrote uh, wrote down that so that I would be able to say exactly what it was. I guess all that is to remain here is that I haven't showed you any any merchandise, but um, you know, there's not anything that's really particularly related. So I just decided to pick something kind of random. Let's see. It's kind of a little tiny bit related. I have um, this really cool grocery bag that says on it, um, Steven Universe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a little comic that tells you how to make the everything bagel dog. Oh, another hot dog berries. Oh, hello. I'm, I'm yeah. reading the bits of recipe I can see, and that looks kind of fun. It's really fun. It, ha- it even has like a little recipe on the side of how to do it. And I've oh, done this, no. yes. So um, <laughs> it's really the only thing I've done that was not in an episode, but was Stephen related. But it's it's just cute. It shows they know their audience that, yes. you know, would like to make the food from the show. And then they said, well, here, here's a bonus food, not on the show. They've even got a difficulty, one star out of four. <laughs> Part of the reason I picked this is just we had weird food. We had uh, a burrito you shouldn't eat. This, I didn't really like it. So, But that's probably also because I don't like cream cheese very much. I can take it or leave it. So. Yeah. So, But one of the reasons that I like this, besides the fact that it's really cute, is that he's making a fusion out of his lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm... He's like, do I want a bagel or a hot dog? Or both together. <laughs> like, Steven, you're fusing your lunch. <laughs> Oh, that was adorable. I take that to grocery shopping, and every once in a while, someone will comment on it and tell me that they like the show, which is fun. Mm-hmm. I'm very excited when people in public will talk to me about the, car- the cartoon <laughs> because of something I'm wearing or something that I'm carrying. And if you ever do decide to make the bagel dog, all the ingredients are right there on your grocery bag. Yes. Yep. So, yeah. Hmm. Let's see. Yep. All right. I told you about my food and I told you about my bag and I'm out of things to tell you. Anything else we should talk about with this episode before we go to the next one? No, we've done our, our fears of body horror, our, ah. our stunnedness at the five-year-old fish bagel, uh, bagel <laughs> burrito. By yes. after, after five years, there might not be much difference. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we might be ready to, to wrap this one up to, Leave our viewers to our viewers, our listeners to muse on what we said. I don't know why I keep saying viewers because all my training has been in radio. And radio doesn't have viewers, but even <laughs> after all these years, I say viewers. <laughs> That's because we secretly want to be on TV. Yeah, I don't though. <laughs> really, I I've been on TV a few times and I don't like it. <laughs> I don't hate it, but I don't like it. The last time I was set to be on TV, I was completely cut around. So I was like, oh, okay. What, maybe, what do you mean? Know, like there was a bunch of us offering contributions about something, some community thing. And uh-huh. when it came on TV, it ended up, I was there in the background and the back of my head was walking out. <laughs> like, oh, no. I mean, 
I know that they weren't going to use every bit of everyone. I said lots of other people could cut too, but it was like, so yeah. I think it was just because one of the shots picked up just after I'd finished speaking. Oh my God. So it, the fact that I knew I'd speak made me go, oh. Mm-hmm. I mean, I doubt they said, oh, cut the redhead or anything like that, but. <laughs> Get her out of there. <laughs> yeah. I've done a couple of things that were that were live, so you know exactly what you're getting, but it's always funny to watch something back after it was recorded or listen back to something after it was recorded, and you're like, they used that, but they didn't use this. <laughs> It's always frustrating, you know, and I mean, I mostly feel like I've been represented authentically in media, not by people who were trying to make me sound bad, but I, I still always found some of the cuts to be disturbing. <laughs> hmm. But anyway, yeah, we're not on TV. <laughs> yeah. And in just a moment, we won't be on podcast for a while because we're about to end this episode and say goodbye to you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to Ivy and Daria on Not So Giant Women. You can find episodes of the show in video form by looking up Not So Giant Women on YouTube or in audio form at anchor.fm slash not so giant women or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on Facebook. Audio production by Daria. Video production and music by Ivy. Daria can also be heard on Postploitation, the Ausploitation podcast. And Ivy at her Steven Universe fan blog at love-takes-work.tumblr.com. Steven Universe was created by Rebecca Sugar and remains property of Cartoon Network. No infringement is intended.